So for our next session, I'll be speaking to, well, Tom Goodwin will be um, presenting. He's a founder of All We Have Is Now. Over to you, Tom. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks very much for joining me. Um, hopefully you can hear me and hopefully you can see my screen. Um, this is going to be a very fast paced presentation. Uh, one, because I don't have much time and two, because you don't have much of an attention span and Zooms are incredibly tiring. So hopefully you will remember the feeling that this gives you and copies of this will be available to anyone at any point in time. Um, this is all about clarity. Everything seems very complex in the world. So I'm going to try and make things simple. Um, and that's kind of my role. My role is to understand the change that matters in the world. What is changing? What is not changing? Does it matter or not? And then secondly, increasingly to actually help companies really, really change in a profound way. Um, change is obviously a very big business. Um, there are thousands of consultancies that will go out there and talk about the enormous amount of change in the world. What are you doing about NFTs? What are you doing about blockchain? Voice is going to change everything. AI is going to steal your job. You can feel the anxiety already. Um, but is that actually true? And do those things really matter? That's the kind of heart of what I try to get to because we have spent a long time um, thinking about things which have not necessarily been that impactful, you know, whether it's chatbots, whether it's blockchain, curved TV screen, 3D printers, 5G. I've had 5G now for about six months and it's changed nothing um, about my life and I think it's changed nothing about other people's. Um, so we need to get a much better, do a much better job of kind of focusing on, on what really matters. Sadly for me, um, it's a much harder way to make a living. Um, it's much more beneficial to say that everything is going to change and then guide people through. Um, but my role is really about understanding what you should say no to, finding reassurance and then focusing on the things that really matter. Um, we are obviously at a period of time where life feels very uncertain and different and we're watching tons of stuff um, streamed via the internet. And we think that somehow that's strange, but actually this has been very easily predicted. The growth of streaming, while it's been a bit extraordinary this year, this has not been something that should take us from nowhere. Um, similarly, we're now joining Zoom calls, which you know somehow feels like it's come from nowhere, but actually it's been a steadily increasing trend. Things like e-commerce, we should have reasonably predicted. We should have also reasonably predicted predicted the death of the department store. There's probably never been more clear lines in life than the growth of e-commerce and the death of the department store. And obviously we're doing things like online learning and online training. And again, there's no reason why we shouldn't have seen this coming. Um, so we have to face this sort of uncomfortable reality, really, that the pace of change isn't actually especially fast right now. Um, the world really isn't particularly chaotic in the grand scheme of things. The future isn't really that hard to predict or unknowable. Um, and we just keep on getting distracted by stuff that's quite irrelevant. Um, obviously, we're in a weird interim. Obviously, um, March in 2021 is an extraordinary period of time. And obviously, the last year has been bananas. Um, but it is a short interim. And these long term trends that we've seen for a while have basically created a now and a future that we should have seen coming. Um, but at the same time of all this profound change um, that hasn't happened in the world, we also must face the reality that most companies really have not changed either. We are obsessed with this idea that every industry is radically different. The banks have changed, the TV shows are different, the electricity providers have radically changed their offering. And actually, considering how much abundant new technology we have and considering the remarkable new consumer behaviors we have, the world around us has really, really not changed changed that much and we should do something about it. I mean, what we've tended to do is we've taken these amazing new devices, whether it's 5G, whether it's smartphones, whether it's the internet, and we've used it to sort of augment and lubricate the world that we had before. And now I hope is a time that we get to build a new one. We get to focus on the profound technology that can make a really big difference to consumers' lives and a really big difference to our commercial realities. And we get to sort of build a much newer and better technology and environment. 
Um, so we probably need to explain why we feel that things are changing so fast. We should probably try to understand why we feel anxious and why the world feels so chaotic. And I think what we really have is one huge battle in almost every industry, and that's the legacy versus the technology startup or the insurgent. And for me, this comes down to one very, very core question, which is can legacy company X get good at technology before technology company Y gets good at the industry that you're in. It, it really does come down to that. So we see all sorts of little battles going on, really. We've got, you know, can Robin Hood get good at making money from share trading before Ameritrade gets good at technology? Will we work, get good at making money from offices before we just gets good understanding what technology can do for their business. Will all birds get good at making money from shoes before Sketches gets good at understanding the different consumer dynamics and business models? These kind of battles happen in all sorts of directions around the world. I mean, there really are many, many, many companies out there in almost every industry that are these tech insurgents that are making us feel very anxious. We're making us feeling like we're missing a trick and that somehow not doing things right. Um, there's another bit of tension in the world, really, which is the way that consumers have been spoiled by these remarkable companies. So if we have this very vague concept of how good stuff feels along the left hand side and we have a sense of time progressing along the bottom, we can see that most companies have improved slowly the experience or the feeling that you have of a product or buying it. Um, what is possible is clearly amazing. New technology combines with other new technology and what can be done improves very, very quickly. And what tends to happen is these sort of insurgent tech startups because they don't have legacy infrastructure and because they've got thrusting new confident people, they tended to produce the best in class experience. And what that's kind of created are these sort of gaps. So a while ago when things were a bit better with another company than another, if things weren't quite as good as they could have been, we would just say, you know, that's life. Um, but increasingly legacy companies are held to account by the improved standards that other companies offer. And there's a constant sense of dissatisfaction. And there's also this real sense that things could be amazing. And they're a bit disappointed by how things are compared with what's possible. So again, these, these sort of are the elements, the fueling, the feelings that I think we all have. And I think maybe this is the final one. Um, these companies are also held to account by different standards. So a company like Monzo or Oyo or Netflix or Airbnb or Tesla or Lemonade, I mean, they don't really have to make any money at the moment. Um, all they really seem to have to deliver um, is rapid user growth. I mean, ideally, they're in a massive addressable market. And actually, every time they make any money, it's generally considered to be a bit of a lack of ambition, really. It's like they haven't invested it wisely enough. Um, and these companies um, are doing battle with these other companies. These are the sort of legacy companies that I referred to before. And these companies are supposed to make more money every single month. They're supposed to increase their revenue month on month, year on year. And they're also supposed to increase their profitability year on year. And this sort of tension between the two, I mean, this idea that CarMax, who makes an absolute fortune from selling an incredibly large number of cars, are uh, somehow being made to feel slightly sort of guilty and slightly stupid because they're not like Carvana, who don't sell that many cars and make a loss on every single car, but because they're called a technology company, they're held to account by different standards. So all of this has created an enormous feeling of tension and an immense feeling of chaos and an immense sense of uncertainty and a really, really sort of gut uh, feeling of the fact that they need to change. And I think there's a degree of frustration and anxiety and concern, and there's not really a business model for change. It's extremely hard for legacy companies to invest in meaningful change. Um, so I'd like to briefly outline, broadly speaking, what companies should do. Um, the first is to understand change. Um, this sounds quite simple, but to really, really understand the changes that matter. 
um, there have been many, many, many principles of business that have suddenly changed. You know, for absolute, you know, for centuries, companies were based on owning assets, on having expert staff, on having a legacy of knowledge, of having real experience, of having trusted brands of uh, scale. Those were what would be considered the hallmarks of success. And now slowly these things are changing. A world of globalization I means you have to compete with everybody. Everything is now incredibly easy. You know, I can now set up a bookstore that can sell my book in 179 countries and it takes me about 45 minutes. Access to capital is incredibly easy. Um, regulation is changing the areas that people are able to explore. Questions like what is a bank are actually extremely hard uh, to answer. And there are other factors here that I don't have time to go into. But there is a radically changing business environment where many of the principles and laws we long believed to be true and sacrosanct and worked around have now changed. We also have incredible new consumer behaviors. Um, again, I can't go through all of these things, but we live in a world of abundance. For, for most of our civilization, we wanted more, now we just want better. So we really have to rethink our offerings. Um, we live in this world of incredible new possibilities. You know, we don't have to own things. We have scalable architecture. We can do things like personalization. We can decentralize. And then finally, new threats. Uh, the main one here really is asymmetric competition. Um, so now a media company like Peloton can reasonably threaten the, in, you know, the market for equipment in health, but also gym providers. So we need to understand the environment of change. The second thing we need to do is really create a vision. You know, what is the way forward for our company? This was the premise of my book. What would your company look like if you built it today? And you really have to transform what you make. There's a lot of nonsense being said by people like Simon Sinek, which is all about the why. It's actually about the what. What's the experience that you create? What do people pay for? How do you make money? And it's that that goes to the very core of your business. So you need to do things like business model innovation. You need to be inventing new products or maybe rethinking the experience that you offer. Once you've figured out what it is that you're making and how it is that you're making money, you should probably think about the structure and the process that you need to follow in order to do that. So this becomes the outer, the, the sort of inner, uh, the second uh, sort of layer in your process. So how do you make what you make? And here you're really talking about quite boring stuff that really matters. Um, it might be the processes that you follow. It might be the structure of your organization. Do you need a hierarchy or structure? What kind of roles do you need? What kind of staff do you actually need to employ? versus having as freelancers, what kind of processes can you outsource altogether? What kind of locations are you working from? What technology are you using? What is your investment strategy? And a very core thing here is actually data strategy, which should go to the very heart of your company in the modern era. And then finally, uh, and this seems odd because this surely should come first, but I believe that after putting in place the vision, after putting in place the structure, you then think about how you create or nurture a culture. People talk a lot about culture change. I'm not sure if that's possible. I think it maybe is an exercise in creating a new culture that you move across to. Um, that raises very interesting questions like uh, what are the roles that people do? What are the KPIs that you use to measure people? What kind of annual reviews do you do? Maybe you have continual learning. How is recruitment done in this age? What about diversity? Um, and I mean real diversity, diversity in all directions, but also diversity that we want. There's a lot of people who speak about diversity and they say the right things, but it's an attitude to realize that bringing together very different people is incredibly good fun and it is totally brilliant for your business. This is not a quota to fill, this is a mindset to unleash because diversity of thought is everything in the world and has always been that way and we have to change how we think about it. We should also be doing things like rethinking careers. This has been extremely quick. Um, there is a feeling somehow in the world that there will be a period of time when new technology arrives you know, we will have AR headsets, 5G will be more prevalent, we will have blockchain, we will have more um, sort of powerful computers. 
And I think people use that as an excuse. I think realistically, this precise moment in time has probably been the best time there has ever been to rethink what your company does and how you make money. We have every single thing that we need in the world right now. We have all of the excuses that we have, we can destroy quite quickly. So I genuinely believe that we have all we need. And what we really need to do is accept that actually all we have is now as well. So that's why I called my company this, because now is the time to make a difference. Let's get some urgency, let's get some optimism, and let's create a much better future for all of us. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Tom. You raised some really interesting points there. Um, I've, we've got time for a couple of questions. So you say we have all we need. And then you also said that data strategy has got to be the heart of, um, you know, everything really and what, what a business does. Um, earlier on um, in some of the polls, yeah. um, some marketers were expressing, you know, some concern of the fact that, you know, does the business really believe in what they're doing? And others were saying, actually, you know, what do we do around data? So how, if data strategy is at the heart of everything, how how do we unearth that? How do you know, how does that realize itself? And what do what do marketers need to do? Um, I mean, sure, um, technology and data are quite similar in that we have said yes to all of it and we've invited it into every aspect of our company and every aspect of our life and we've never really thought, what are we doing with it? Mm. Um, so broadly speaking, data strategy is just the process of figuring out what are we trying to do with it and then what do we need in order to do that? Who needs to access it? How do we keep it secure? How do we make sure that our customers are happy with us taking that? And how do we give them something in value in return? Turn. Um, and those are quite profound questions that people don't ask. Um, most companies' data strategy is just to gather as much as they possibly can and then hope to figure out what to do with it later. So the start really should be, as you say, the questioning and actually rather than, you know, before you start sifting into it, actually looking at why yeah. and what, what are the reasons behind it. Yes, I mean, data, you know, there's kind of two reasons really to do data. One is to make better decisions with it, and the other is to sort of feel out the environment and to learn more proactively. Yeah. And I think um, those two different focus points are quite key. So the, the specific one that is most helpful is what decisions am I making with this data? And when you actually think about it in those terms, often you need remarkably little data. That's a really good point. So, what decisions, what decisions do you know do you need from from that data? Um, I'm going to end on that, Tom. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was a really good session.